Our scripture reading this morning, it uh, comes from Genesis chapter 1, uh, verses 26 to 27 and 31. And then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may overrule, they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created humans in his image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. And then in Revelations chapter 21, verses 1 through 5, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making all things new. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, my friend. Well, every good story needs three things, they say. A beginning, a middle, and an end. That's how stories work, right? Because if you don't start at the beginning, there's no way you're going to understand what's happening in the middle. And if you don't go all the way through to the end, you're going to be left frustrated and confused, right? Every good story needs a beginning, and a middle, and an end. When my boys were little, their favorite film was Finding Nemo. Have you guys seen this one? I watched Finding Nemo more times than I care to count. But can you imagine if I had fast-forwarded past the part where Nemo loses his mother and gains his lucky fin? We would never have understood, right, like why Nemo's dad was so anxious and why they got in that big fight, and why he swam out to the boat, and how he ended up in a dentist's fish tank. And in the same way, if we never saw the end, we wouldn't have known why the movie was called Finding Nemo, right? It's because beginnings and endings, they matter. The beginning of a story, it tells us who the characters are. It tells us the history. It tells us where we've been and where we're going. And so as the story goes on, it will continue to make sense to us. And this is just as true when we look at our own stories, isn't it? Especially as they are reflected in God's word. Because where we begin a story really, really matters. In the book of Genesis, whose title just means beginnings, it's our sacred text for understanding how we came to be, what it means to be human. But unfortunately, there are a lot of folks that skip ahead, that fast forward a couple chapters, and they begin the story in Genesis 3 rather than Genesis 1. Now let me explain what I mean by that. In the first couple chapters of Genesis, we get these poetic accounts of God creating the cosmos, God's loving presence forming the world and animals and all creatures, bringing everything together. 
And it culminates in the pinnacle of creation, God making human beings in God's own image and calling them good. Pamela just read a beautiful and short section from that passage a few minutes ago. And it's unfortunate that so many folks don't start there. It really is. Instead, they begin in Genesis 3 with what we commonly refer to as the fall or humanity's fall into sin. This is that story you probably remember from children's books. <laughs> Sneaky little serpent convincing Adam and Eve to eat the forbidden fruit that God had commanded them not to. I think we all know this story pretty well. It goes that Adam and Eve were innocent. They were whole. They were perfect, in perfect relationship with one another and with God. They were naked, and they had no idea they were naked. That's how vulnerable they could be. But they take a bite of that proverbial apple, and suddenly everything's different. Immediately, they are aware of their nudity. Immediately, they become distrustful of one another. They blame each other. And even worse, when they hear God approaching them, they run in fear and hide from God. And so God tells them that there will be these natural consequences for the choice that they made. That sin enters the story now and it starts to change everything. It begins to distort who Adam and Eve have previously been and been called to be. Their relationship to themselves and to one another, to the earth and to God has been changed. It's been fractured. And so humanity has fallen, and it continues to impact us to this day. But as tragic as that chapter is, and it is a very sad chapter in the story, we have got to remember that Genesis 3 is not where the story starts. It doesn't begin there. Skipping over Genesis 1 and putting all the emphasis on the fall into sin it has caused us to grossly misunderstand the rest of the story. It really has. And that's because where we begin a story has significant implications for understanding what it means to be a person. It does. Are we talking about a narrative that begins by centering us, by centering our brokenness, human sinfulness? Or are we talking about a story that centers the creative love of God? If we begin with sin defining what it is to be human, the story heads in the wrong direction really, really quickly. It gets dark pretty quick. But our story does not begin in the fall. It does not begin with Genesis 3. Rather, it starts with God's creative love for the whole world, for all humanity. We are not named and defined by brokenness. We are named and defined by the God who made us in God's image and said it was very good. We are called beloved children of God. And the whole of Scripture affirms this, it does, even in light of our fallenness. 1 John 3, 1 declares, what marvelous love God has extended to all of us. Just look at it. We're called the children of God. That is who we really are. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians 1 writes, You were chosen in Christ before the world was made to stand before God in love, marked out beforehand as fully adopted sons and daughters of God. This is our identity. This is who we really are. This is the most true thing about you and me. Sure, there might be plenty of other things that are true about us, but the most true thing about you is that you are a beloved child of God, created in God's image to bear God's goodness. Thomas Merton put this beautifully when he said this. He said, to say that I am made in the image of God is to say that, the, that love is the reason for my existence, for God is love. Love is my true identity. Love is my true character. Love is my name. And let's be real, right? Like, that is a way better story, isn't it? Sin only enters the narrative after this. 
And it threatens our God-given identity by inviting us to think, to believe, and to act in ways that are contrary to who we were called and created to be. They're inconsistent with who God made us. Sin cripples us, surely, but it does not get to define us. Within each of us exists the image of God. However disfigured and corrupted by sin, it may presently be in you and in me. One of the most heartbreaking things for me as a pastor is knowing that there are a lot of people that walk through this world defining themselves based on the worst thing that they've ever done or the worst thing that's ever happened to them. They sort of go through the world assuming that God is just mad at them, that God is just chronically disappointed in them. Maybe you understand that all too well yourself. And if you know your church history, you will remember that this is exactly what Martin Luther believed. This is exactly the way he felt in his younger years. You didn't think I'd preach on Reformation Sunday without mentioning Luther, did you? (laughs) But before Luther's dramatic conversion experience, where like a light bulb, he suddenly understood that God loved him, that God offered him the gift of salvation through grace and faith alone, He spent most of his life truly believing that God hated him, absolutely sure of it. He would go to confession over and over every day, just sure that he had done something wrong, sure that the divine was angry with him. He was convinced of it. He had defined his identity around Genesis 3, around sin. He'd skipped ahead in the story. But everything changed for him when Luther just encountered the incredible, gracious love of God. He came to see that his truest identity was as a beloved child of God. He would realized he started the story in the wrong place, and once he was captured by that better story, he couldn't keep quiet about it. He was like a man on a mission to make sure everyone knew who they really were a beloved child redeemed through Jesus Christ and created in God's image for love. And so he would go on to write this. He said, The chief and sole purpose of the gospel is to restore us to the image of God. Love is the image of God. And this is not a lifeless image, but a living essence of the divine nature which beams full of goodness. And so the closer one moves toward love, the closer they approach the image of God. But you know, theologians before and after Luther have puzzled about what does it mean exactly that we bear God's image? They've wondered. They've written lots and lots about it. I mean, is this about the mind and the intellect in humanity that allows us to reflect God's image? Is it about our thinking self, our ability to make memory and meaning of this world? Or, Or is it less about thinking and it's more about us being feeling creatures? We're not just rationalizing our experience, but we feel our way through this world. Or or is God's image really more about the work that humans are called to do? We're supposed to populate the earth and carry on the work of creation. Or, Or maybe it's really more like a relational connection, that we're somehow connected and related to God, and that's what it means to bear God's image, that there's like a small piece of God somehow in each of us. And the best answer everyone's got Yeah, all those things are true, and more than we can probably understand and comprehend. And even though we may not be very good at reflecting that image all the time, the gift and mystery of bearing God's image is what we were made for. It is. It's who you really are. God created you in God's image, and God said it was very good. It was very good. And so, yeah, sin has come in to the narrative. Sin messes with us, for sure. It messes with me. But sin doesn't get to rename us. Sin doesn't get to define who we are. Father Richard Rohr, a Franciscan priest and one of my favorite spiritual teachers, describes this as the difference between image and likeness. Image is your unquestionable identity as God's beloved child. Likeness, however, is your personal appropriation of that. It's what you do with your God-given identity. 
And so image, you have. No one gets to take that from you. But likeness, you grow in as you come to encounter God's love, as it changes you. And that distinction really helps me because it keeps me rooted in who I am at the core, the most true thing about me. It does. And even on my worst days, when I struggle to reflect that image, I'm called to walk in the likeness of who God's made me to be. I just think it seems that most of us have spent our lives assuming that the story starts in Genesis 3. We've centered so much of the plot around ourselves and around our brokenness, so it can be hard to imagine that something else might be true about us. You know, I don't know if you know this, but in the book of the prophet Isaiah, God tells us he has a nickname for us, <laughs> a nickname. And I think there's something in us that sort of assumes, based on what we know of ourselves, that this is not going to be a good nickname. <laughs> we sort of brace ourselves and are like, what could it be? But do you know what God calls you? My delight. My delight. Not my disappointment. My delight. Why is that so hard for us to believe? Greg Boyle is an author, and he's the founder of the largest gang reforming program in the world, Homeboy Industries in Los Angeles. And he tells this really moving story about a man named Andrew, who is a former gang member out of jail and in recovery. And Andrew has three small children that he's trying to establish a relationship with. Andrew didn't know his own father, but he's trying to do it differently with his kids. And so on his day off, he decides that he's going to take his kids to the library, and he's going to read to them. He can't quite afford yet to buy his children the library he dreams for them, but he's like, I can take them to the library and read for free. <laughs> and so Andrew brings his kids into the library and takes them through the sections, and they pick a big stack of kids' books. And then they go find their way to the sitting area with the overstuffed chairs, and he pulls his kids into his lap, and he starts to read to them. And as he's reading, he notices out of the corner of his eye that a librarian is standing there with his face scrunched up, staring at him and his children. And Andrew just knows this guy's upset with him. And he's wondering, like, what, what is it? Maybe it's all his tattoos. Maybe it's like his ghetto appearance. Maybe it's his dialect or his accent. Maybe that he's sitting in the wrong section. Maybe kids aren't supposed to be in these nice chairs. Maybe he's just reading too loud. But the librarian stays, <clears throat> stands there the whole time staring at him. Well, eventually he gets through his books with his kids, and they're heading out, and the librarian calls him over. And Andrew thinks, oh, great, here we go. He's going to tell me all the things I did wrong. So Andrew walks over there, already frustrated. But this librarian just looks in Andrew's eyes, and his own eyes fill with tears. And he just says, you're such a good dad. You're doing a really good job. You're doing a good job. And Andrew is just stunned speechless, he says. Because his experience in this world has taught him to assume that all anyone would ever see in him was the mess he had made of his life. But all this librarian can see in him is that he's doing a good job. I think God is like that. I think God is watching us from the side, not pointing out where we failed. No. Reminding us who we really are. Looking in our eyeballs and saying, you're doing a good job. You're doing okay. The late theologian Frederick Buchner wrote this. He said, I believe there is within us this image of God. There is something deep within us in everybody, but it gets buried and distorted and confused and corrupted by what happens to us. But it's still there as a source of insight and healing and strength. The good news of Jesus Christ promises us that sin's crippling impact, though it might feel overwhelming to us, it's ultimately been redeemed by the love of God in Christ Jesus. In the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God has transformed the whole world by revealing to us what God is really like, who God really is. 
God is not chronically disappointed in you. God is not mad at you. God is reminding you who you really are. In Jesus Christ, we see God absolutely refuse to start the story in Genesis 3. He refuses to do it. It's not dividing up the world into sacred and secular, pure and impure, sinner or saint. No, Jesus doesn't reject sinners. He spends his entire life loving people and reminding them who they really are. And so let me be clear. You are not defined by the worst thing you've ever done. And you are not defined by the worst thing that's ever happened to you. That is not who you are. Rather, you are invited to be made whole and forgiven and healed. You are invited to life and life flourishing. The most true thing about you is that you have been created in the image of God and you are a beloved child of God. That is who you really are. That is who we all are. And so when we're doing this faith thing right, we recognize that divine image in one another. We don't see one another for the brokenness. We see one another for God's love. Calvin said this, he said, We are not to reflect on the wickedness of men, but to look to the image of God in them, an image which covers and obliterates their faults, an image which by its beauty, beauty and dignity should allure us to love and embrace them. This is who we really are. And so finally, I just want to leave you with a little spoiler alert on how this story ends. I know there are a lot of people and a lot of churches that spend much of their time fretting about eternal judgment. They look at the world and the hot mess that it is, and they just assume the whole thing's going up in hellfire. But did you hear that passage from Revelation that she just read? Did you hear the one about a new creation and a new earth from the book of Revelation, the end of the story? The one that reminds us that God will wipe away every single tear, that there will be no more suffering, there will be no more death. The one where Jesus declares from the throne of God, I am making everything new. Everything. That is where the story ends. Friends, the story ends with God's love, with wholeness, with life with flourishing. We've spent way too much time focusing on the middle, way too much time focusing on our own brokenness. But the good news of God's love demands that we remember the whole thing starts and ends with God and with love. Not only is that the truth, but that is a way better story. And it's your story, and it's mine. And we're invited to live into it and make it our own. Would you pray with me? God, we place our lives before you, thanking you for loving us and calling us your beloved children. Surely there are many people here today that grabbed onto this good news and this good story a long time ago, letting your story of love transform their lives. But God, for any folks who are here and realizing that they've just been living a lesser story, one that centers their own fallenness, leaves them feeling empty and ashamed, I pray, God, that they would be absolutely transformed by the good news that your love is the only thing that gets to define them, that the most true thing about them is that they are a beloved child of God created in your image. Let your love wash over us, God. Let your love swallow us whole. May we begin and end our story in you. Amen.